Chapter 6, Zack Hello, he said brightly, grasping Winnie's hand. There was a loud squelching of mud as he shook it. Sorry, gasped Willie in embarrassment. The strange boy grinned and wiped it on the seat of his shorts. You're William Beach, aren't you? William nodded. Pleased to meet you. I'm Zacharias Wrench. Oh, said Willie. Yes, I know, it's a mouthful, isn't it? My parents have a cruel sense of humour. I'm called Zack for short. The strange boy's eyes seemed to penetrate so deeply into Willie's that he felt sure he could read his thoughts. He averted his gaze and began hurriedly to cover the Anderson again. I say, can I help? I'd like to. Willie was quite taken aback at being asked. I'm rather good at it, actually, he continued proudly. I've given a hand at the creation of several. I wouldn't mess it up. Yeah, replied Willie quietly, if you want. Thanks. I say, he said as he dumped a handful of earth on the side of the shelter, I'll show you around. Do you like exploring? Willie shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. Is it your first visit to the country? But before Willie could reply, the boy was already chattering on. It's not mine exactly. I've had odd holidays with friends and my parents, but this is the first time I've actually sort of lived in the country. I've read books that are set in the country and, of course, poems, and I've lived in towns near the country and gone into the country on Sundays or when there was no school. He stopped and there was a moment of silence as they carried on working. You've not been here long, have you? he asked after a while. Willie shook his head. Else, I'm sure I would have seen you around. You're different. Willie raised his head nervously. Am I? Yes, I sensed that as soon as I saw you. There's someone who's a bit of a loner, I thought. An independent sort of a soul like myself, perhaps. Willie glanced quickly at him. He felt quite tongue-tied. You're living with Mr Oakley, aren't you? He nodded. He's a bit of a recluse, I believe. What? said Willie. A recluse, you know. Keeps himself to himself. Oh, I say, said Zack suddenly. We'll be at school together, won't we? He shrugged his shoulders again. I don't know. He felt somewhat bewildered. He couldn't understand this exuberant friendliness in a boy he'd only had a glimpse of twice. It was all too fast for him to take in. I expect you think I'm a bit forward, remarked Zack. What? Forward, you know. But you see, my parents work in the theatre and I'm so used to moving from town to town that I can't afford to waste time. As soon as I see someone I like, I talk to them. Willie almost dropped the clod of earth he was holding. No one had ever said that they liked him. He'd always accepted that no one did. Even his mum said she only liked him when he was quiet and still. For her to like him, he had to make himself invisible. He hurriedly put the earth onto the shelter. I say, said Zack after a while. I can't reach the top. Is there a ladder indoors? Willie nodded. Where is it? In the hall. It's Mr Tom's. He won't mind, Willie. I don't know, whispered Willie, a little panic-stricken. I'll take the blame if there's any trouble, said Zack. I say, maybe we can finish it and put the ladder back before he returns. It'll be a surprise then, won't it? Willie nodded dumbly. Lead the way then, cried Zack. On, on, on and with that they made their way towards the back door. Meanwhile, after walking in almost total darkness with no lights to guide him, save the fast darkening sky, Tom reached the village hall. It came as quite a shock to enter the brightly lit building. He shaded his eyes and blinked for a few seconds until he had adjusted to the change. There were far more people than he had anticipated, and the buzz of excited chatter was quite deafening. He tried to slip in unnoticed, but it was too late. He had already been spotted by Mrs Miller. Well, Mr Oakley, she burbled, this is a surprise. He turned to frown her into silence. She was decked out in her Sunday best. A pink billow pillar box hat was perched precariously on her head and pinned to its side was a large artificial purple flower. It hung half suspended over her mottled pudgy cheeks. The hat could have been a continuation of her face, Tom thought. The colours were so similar. He cleared his throat. Vicar called the meeting, so here I am. Yes, of course, said Mrs Miller. He glanced quickly around the hall. Some of the older boys were already in uniform. 
their buff-coloured boxes slung over their shoulders. Mr Peters, Charlie Ruddles and Mr Bush were seated in the front with Mr Thatcher and Mr Butcher. He slipped quietly to the back of the hall, catching sight of Nancy and Dr Little and acknowledged their presence with a slight gesture of his hand. He attempted to stand inconspicuously in a corner but it was useless, for most of the villagers nudged one another and turned to stare in his direction. Tom, as Zack said, kept himself to himself. He didn't hold with meetings or village functions. Since his wife, Rachel's, death, he hadn't joined in any of the social activities in Little Weirwald. In his grief, he had cut himself off from people, and when he had recovered, he had lost the habit of socialising. "'Evening, Mr Oakley,' said Mrs Fletcher, who was busy knitting in the back row. "'Left the boy, as you?' "'With Sam,' he added by way of defence. He had been surprised at Sam's willingness to stay, and had even felt a flicker of jealousy when he had flopped contentedly down in the grass beside the boy's feet. Although most wireless owners had opened their doors so that people could listen to the King's message, Mr Peters talked about it for those who had missed it. He mentioned the regulations regarding the blackout and the carrying of gas masks, and Mr Thatcher, the tall ginger-haired father of the twin girls and their dark-haired sister, spoke about the procedure of action during an air raid. Gum boots and oilskins were given out and ordered for volunteers. It was decided that the first aid post would be at Dr and Nancy Little's cottage and that the village hall was to be the rest centre. Mrs Miller threw her puffy arm into the air and volunteered to run a canteen for any troops that might pass through. This suggestion was greeted with howls of laughter at the idea of anyone bothering to take a route that included Little Weirwald. However, Lillian Peters, seeing how hurt Mrs Miller was, said that she thought it was a good idea and after suggesting that a weekly gathering of the evacuated mothers and their infants would also be an excellent idea, Mrs Miller sat down beaming because she believed she had thought of it herself. Mr Bush announced that Mrs Black had agreed to help at the school as there would be an extra 70 children attending. She was a quietly spoken old lady who had been retired for seven years. Going to have her hands full with some of that town lot, Tom remarked to himself. Several people volunteered for being special constables, but Tom remained silent. His life had been well ordered and reasonably happy, he thought, by minding his own business. The last thing he wanted was to turn himself into a do-gooder, but he realised very quickly that most of the volunteers were genuinely and sincerely opening their hearts and homes. Mr Thatcher stood up to talk about fire-watching duties. No one is allowed to do more than 48 hours a month, he said, just a couple of days hours a day. Tom raised his arm. Mr Peters looked towards the back of the hall in surprise. Yes, Tom? He asked, did you wish to say something? I'm volunteering, like, he said. I beg your pardon, said Mr Thatcher in amazement. I'll do the two hours a day, early in the morning, like, or tea time. Can't leave the boy alone at night. No, no, of course not, and his name was hurriedly put down. There was a murmur of surprise and enthusiasm in the hall. A tall, angular figure stood up. It was Amelia Thorne. Put mine there too, she said, and while I'm about it, anyone who would like to join our amateur dramatics group is very welcome. Meeting's now on Thursdays, which means you can still attend practices at the first aid post on Wednesdays. Soon, a dozen or so hands were raised, and after their names had been written down and details of what their duties would involve, the meeting was brought to a close. It was dark when Tom stepped out of the hall, he strode away towards the arched lane while the sound of chatter and laughter behind him gradually faded. He recollected, in his mild stupor, that Mrs Fletcher and Amelia Thorne had spoken to him and that the doctor had asked after William and had said something about the boy being over at his place. It was pitch black under the overhanging branches and it wasn't until he reached the gate of Dobbs Field that he was able, at last, to distinguish the shapes of the trees and Dobbs and the wall by the churchyard. He swung open the gate and shut it firmly behind him. Bet Rachel's having a good laugh, he muttered wryly to himself. 
for not only had he volunteered for fire-watching duties, but he had also volunteered the services of Dobbs and the cart since there was news of petrol rationing. He strolled over to the nag and slapped her gently. I'll ask to get you a gas mask, and all, eh, old girl? Seems we're both up to our necks in it now. The stars were scattered in fragments across the sky. Tom stared up at them. It didn't seem possible that there was a war. The night was so still and peaceful, he suddenly remembered Willie. Hope he's had the sense to go inside, he mumbled, and he headed in the direction of home. He opened the little black gate and peered around in the dark for the shelter. He would have bumped into it if he hadn't heard voices. William, William, where is you? Here, Mr Tom, said a voice by his side. Tom squinted down at him. Ain't you got sense enough to go indoors? You'll catch cold in that wet jersey. A loud scrabbling came from inside the Anderson, and Sam leapt out of the entrance and tugged excitedly at his trousers. Tom picked him up, secretly delighted that he hadn't been deserted in affection. Sam licked his face, panting and barking. It was my idea, said a cultured voice, to keep at it. Who's that? asked Tom sharply. Me, Mr Oakley and he felt a hand touch his shirt sleeve. Tom screwed up his eyes to look at Zack. He could make out what looked like a girl in the darkness. I just thought it was a shame to go inside on such a night as this, he continued, so I persuaded Will to partake of my company for a while. Who's Will? asked Tom bluntly. My name for William. He told me he was called Willie, but I thought that was a jolly awful thing to do to anyone. Willie just cries out for ridicule, don't you think? I mean, he went on, it's almost as bad as Zacharias Wrench. What? said Tom. Zacharias Wrench, that's me. Zac, for short. Oh. Willie stared at their silent silhouettes in the darkness for what seemed an eternity. He could hear only the sound of Sam's tongue lathering Tom's face and a gentle breeze gliding through the trees. Best come in said Tom at last. They clattered into the hallway. Tom put the blacks up in the front room, crashed around in the darkness and lit the gas and oil lamps. After he had made a pot of tea, they sat near the range and surveyed each other. Willie's hair, face and clothes were covered in earth. His filthy hands showed up starkly against the white mug he was holding. Zack, Tom discovered, was a voluble, curly-haired boy a few months older than Willie, only taller and in bad need, so he thought, of a haircut. A red jersey was draped around his bare shoulders and a pair of frayed, rather colourful men's braces held up some well-darned green shorts. Apart from his sandals, his legs were bare. "'You finished the shelter, then?' said Tom. When he nodded and glanced in Sack's direction, he helped. "'By the feel of it, you've done a good job. How do you reach the top?' There was a pause. With the ladder, said Willie huskily. Yes, inter- interspersed Sack. That was my idea. Oh, was it now? Yes. You put it back then? Oh, yes, it might be a bit earth stained, though. Tom poked some tobacco in his pipe and relit it. Where are you staying then? You went from round here. With Dr. and Mrs. Little. I've been here for about a week now. Oh said Tom. I haven't seen you around. I haven't seen you around either, said Zack. Willie choked on a mouthful of tea and Zack slapped his back. He flinched. His skin was still bruised and sore. I say, blurted out Zack with concern, you're not one of those delicate mortals, are you? No, he ain't, said Tom sharply. Leastways, not for long. Zack glanced at the clock on the bookcase and stood up. I say, he exclaimed. It's nine o'clock. Thanks awfully for the tea, Mr Oakley. May I come round tomorrow and see Will? Up to William. Ask him. William was so exhausted from the day's labours that he didn't know whether he had dreamt the last remark or not. Can I? said Zack earnestly. I've got a marvellous idea for a game. Yeah. Wizard. Kalu Kalei. With a great effort he attempted to pull his jersey on over his head. He tugged and pulled at it until it eventually moved over his nose and ears, causing his hair to spring up in all directions like soft wire. Phew! he gasped. I did it. 
Mother says I mustn't grow any more till she's collected enough wool to knit me a bigger one. He tugged the sleeves of the jersey down, but they slid stubbornly back to between his wrists and elbows. Good night, Sam, he said, giving him a pat. William, said Tom, see your friend out. Willie stood sleepily to his feet and followed Zack into the hall, closing the door behind them. Ow! cried Zack as his knee hit the stepladder. Willie opened the front door. The sky was still starry and a cool breeze shook the grass between the gravestones. He shivered. Your jersey's awfully damp, said Zack, feeling it. Don't go catching pneumonia. He glanced cautiously round the graveyard. Just looking for spies, he explained. Look, about my idea. You know Captain McBlade? Do you mean Charlie Ruddles? No, said Zack excitedly. Captain McBlade of the Air Police. Is he the Prime Minister or something? No, he took another look round. I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. Roger will go and out. Willie watched him walk down the path and towards the church. He pulled himself up over the wall and disappeared. Who was Roger Wilco, and what did he mean by out, he thought. He stepped back into the hall and felt his way back to the living room. In front of the range stood the large copper tub. Tom was pouring hot water into it, while Tam Sam was hiding under the table and eyeing it suspiciously. Don't worry, Sam, it ain't for you. He looked at Willie. You'll be stiff tomorrow. Best have a good soak. Willie stared in horror at the bubbling water and backed towards the table. He watched Tom lift two more saucepans from the range and empty them together with a handful of salt into the tub. Come on then, he said. Is it for me clothes, Mr Tom? It's for you, Willie swallowed. Please, mister, I can't swim. I'll drown. Ain't you never... But he stopped himself. It was a stupid question. You don't put your head under. You sit in it washes yourself and has a little lean back. It took some time before Willie allowed himself to relax in the water. Tom handed him a large square bar soap and that showed him how to use it. He then proceeded to wash Willie's hair several times with such vigour that Willie thought his head would fall off. A drop of soap trickled into his eyes and he rubbed it only to find that he had created more pain. After this ordeal, Tom left him to have a soak and slowly Willie began to unwind. He held on to the sides of the tub and let his legs float gently to the surface. The gas lamp flickered and sputtered above him, sending moving shadows across the walls. He gave a start, for he had been so relaxed that he had nearly fallen asleep. Tom handed him a towel, and after he had dried himself and had his hair rubbed and combed and had put his pyjamas on, he sat down on the poof by the armchair, while Tom sat ready to tell him a story. Sam spread himself out on the rug between them. I'm going to look at the story first, and then tell us it in me own way, like what I done with Noah. That suit you? Willie nodded and hugged his knees. This is the story of how God created the world, and he began to talk about the light and the darkness, the coming of the sky and the sea, the fish and the animals, and of Adam and Eve. After this, he made them both some cocoa and began the first of the Just So stories. I haven't read these for years, he said, leaning over to Willie. Come and look at these pictures. Willie rested against the arm of the armchair and listened to how the whale got his throat. This was a slow process, for Tom had to keep stopping to explain what the words meant and several times had to look them up in a dictionary. Willie lay in bed that night, tired and aching, but the aches were very pleasant ones, and as he slept, he dreamt that Adam and Eve were being chased by a large whale, and that he stood in the Garden of Eden, wondering if God was nubbly and a infinite source and sagacity.